Uh, good morning to all of you. There was a slight network interruption. Um, I welcome all of you, all the delegates and the participants for this uh, second day of our uh, three days uh, web workshop come training on edible insects. I warmly welcome today's speaker, um, Mike Thornett, and he will be uh, delivering the topic on uh, nutritional pack as a genuine food. Um, may I request now uh, Dr. T. Sandibala, Organizing Secretary, uh, to introduce him as well as to um, brief about his work and his contribution. Madam. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Good morning to everyone. Once again, I welcome you in this second day's uh, three days workshop come training on edible insect. Uh, today also in the first sessions, we have a very dynamic, multi-talented uh, persons with us. It will, I hope you people will enjoy listening to him. And I want to uh, share a brief uh, background of Mike Thornett, Director, Insect Protein Association of Australia. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mike has a background but uh, in various fields, that is in business also, agriculture, aviation, and engineering, specializations in integrated production system. And currently he is a director of Insect Protein Association in Australia, and his organizations aim to promote positive practical and industry relevant regulations and governance that will benefit insect farmers, insect protein supplier and retailer whilst upholding the clean and green brand of Australian producer. And he has been involving in the growing of black soldier fly since 2014. And he himself founded the various research and development and production company called Solution Blue to develop high capacity, low cost flying uh, rearing technology for promotion and utilization of specifically for uh, insect resources. Uh, I welcome uh, Mr. Mick Tornet, and I share uh, uh, you the platform uh, uh, to you so that you can uh, deliver your uh, works to our beloved participant. Th Thank you, sir. I hand over the platform to you. Right. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, thank you very much for having me today. I'll just get set up here. Um, yeah, so I think um, yeah, I was in India a few years ago on a tour looking at um, opportunities there to set up business and an absolute ball and learned quite a lot. And it also started to drive where we were looking at opportunities for our business and how we, how we do things over there. Um, I'll just find my uh, thing here. There it is. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, yes, we can see. Right. Perfect. We're going well then. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm off topic a little bit here, but um, my business is really around a lot of things. It's primarily around production, but also the nutrition component of uh, insects um, and farm economics and how we set up soldier fly farms um, in particular, but also I've had a bit of an interest in other insects for human consumption um, and all that kind of stuff as well. So obviously the introduction, um, I'm the CEO and founder of Solution Blue and a director of the Insect Protein Association of Australia. I've had around eight years experience now growing insects. Um, when I started, it was fairly basic. We didn't have much information out there, but obviously now the internet is thriving. We have tons of stuff out there. So it's, it's really easy to get in, but there's a lot of things still to learn. So that's been a big focus, um, I suppose, this presentation is a bit on things you should know to, to get started in this. Um, and I'll try and cover a bit on how to design a farm or how to get started in farming and the things to look out for, because I know I fell in quite a lot of uh, traps uh, when I got into this. Um, the Insect Protein Association here, we're really trying to change regulation, but also educate um, local farmers and people that want to get into the get into um, the business of insect farming. Um, there's a lot of popular farmed insects. The top ones that are really get, getting the attention, I find are crickets, um, mealworms, 
now cockroaches and fly larvae. Uh, they all have their own challenges to grow, but all have different qualities and are suited to different types of um, markets. The crickets are probably um, the most well-known and accepted, I guess, as human consumption. Um, they've been popular for years, and I, I think all through Southeast Asia, uh, Southern America, uh, crickets are a big part of the diet in some places. They have a lot of challenges um, around space and grow out times. However, they are, they're a great product um, and, and like all insects, suitable for all you know, human consumption or, or animal feed. Mealworms um, also becoming popular. One of the biggest um, manufacturers of mealworms have now started up in Europe. And um, that's looking like a big thing, but also it's a, it's a, a slow growing product um, compared to others and uh, requires a fair bit of uh, hard technology, not hard technology, but a lot of technology to grow efficiently. Uh, the cockroaches we're seeing throughout China more so, um, and they're going for human consumption, but also the great thing about cockroaches and then the flies, which I do, the fly larvae, um, they can consume waste. So they're really great as a extra sustainable product. You know, when you're using waste resources, like food waste um, and things like that, we can also use manures. We can grow these things fast and process that um, and get a product uh, ready for market fairly quickly. But there are also challenges around that as well. Um, end products, this is a big part of, um, I suppose we start looking at, you know, where we, where we place an insect farm, um, the type of business we want to run. The big one, I think, over here, um, and it's been promoted more so, I suppose, throughout um, Europe, Australia, um, and the US is as animal feed. However, it is still the smallest section of the market by weight, I suppose, worldwide. Um, it's, um, yeah, so that animal feed is probably the main one that we, we concentrate on here. However, we are looking at more human consumption. Um, and after human consumption, we go to the petrochemicals and energy, um, medicinal use, cosmetics, fertilizer, but also that market of waste management where we're looking after um, waste, not going to landfill here uh, and things like that. So there's a market there. However, we have to be careful with that product and what we produce as far as safety goes. Um, we also have a lot of other, other interesting niches coming into this, uh, which we won't go into because it's not really around that protein area, uh, but it is certainly a, a, a fast growing industry. And it's, I think it's tipped to be around $3 billion uh, by, the, by 2030, three to 8 billion worldwide. Um, but I think that is estimated mainly to be in uh, animal feed and things like that. Okay, so going to insect nutrition, um, this, um, page is a guide really on uh, the different types of insects that I suppose are grown around the world. There's, it is a guide. And one of the things we're learning very quickly is insects. I think when we got into this, we thought we're going to be a really great product, easy to grow um, and a fairly standard uh, thing. But as it turns out, they're much like every other animal. Um, this guide is fairly accurate as a, as a general guide, but we see numbers varying internally by about 30%. We've seen protein in soldier fly larvae go from anywhere from 30 to 45% and the fat content uh, change as well. Now it's not so much of an issue. We, um, each product's value and it's valuable in its own right. So the end market, we can split that down. We can create some really good value there. Um, but yeah, don't, uh, I think one of the first things we learn about this is the nutrition of the insect does vary and it varies considerably and does depend on diet as well as the growing environment. So these are things that um, you must be aware of, I think, getting into this and how we approach the later commercial aspects of a, of a company or bringing lots of small businesses together in a typical farming um, scenario. So the types of things we're feeding. Now, if we're looking at, um, say, your crickets, your mealworms and things like that, they're a high value product. Usually, I think retailing for around $50 US a kilogram. So we're feeding them good products. You know, we're feeding them grains and cereals um, and things like that. Um, they're slow, but those sorts of materials, I, I think we can justify using them. They're still sustainable. We're looking at 
I think a three to four to one conversion, something in that range when we're looking at those insects. So it's sustainable um, like that compared to uh, other meat products, uh, but also sustainable when we look at the, the cash conversion side there as well. The fun stuff I suppose for everybody really is the feed or the, the waste converters. So we look at soldier flies and cockroaches because they can consume a lot of uh, low value products fast. So we're looking at food waste, uh, manure and things like that. They, are, they all can uh, change a lot in the way they work. So the big part here is a balanced diet seems to be a trick, just like for yourself, we need to balance the diet of an insect. So if we went all one way with chicken manure, we'd have a good end product. However, it takes a long time to get there. If we mix that with uh, some vegetable waste, It'll be a lot faster. So all these different aspects change the rates of growth and, and the end product. Um, but we're still finding out new things every day. We're doing a project now, which we found um, two completely different um, um, nutritional profiles from two very similar samples. And we're trying to just work out how that's happened. And we think it might just be the growing environment that's changed the way the insects have, uh, have grown. So this is still, I suppose, a relatively new space and trying to work out all the nuances of nutritional side of insects. However, overall, they are a great thing. So um, any feed will do to start, but it will also determine uh, how you're going to set up your business later. Right, um, hang on. Yep. So which insect? This is, this is one of the hard things I think now um, with so many options. How do you justify the use of one insect over another? Um, the first thing really is where you're setting up and what feed you have available will determine uh, what you're gonna grow. So if I have a lot of food waste and things like that to get rid of, I definitely go down the track of, um, of something like flies, fly larvae, like soldier, larvae, soldier flies or the, the common house fly. They're really fast converters of food waste. They fix up that problem. Um, we see uh, particularly here a food waste going to landfill. We eliminate that and we create really good products in the form of protein, but also in the form of um, fertilizer. So the castings, known as the frass, um, that's a, a really good thing for, for agriculture. So if we have a lot of that sort of wet vegetable feed, um, we definitely go down that track of um, soldier flies and things like that, or we need to dry it out to grow things like crickets. Um, and mealworms. The type of technology we have available, and that comes into um, a few different ways. And that technology would be, if you're a small farm um, and you want this as an extra thing to do, in small quantities, uh, you'd be doing it in small boxes. However, if we want to do it on an industrial scale, say near a big center, where we have access to lots and lots of byproducts, say from a food manufacturing facility, we go to some really high tech solutions here to get the job done so um, depending on how access how much access you have to that kind of technology would determine also the type of insect you would grow um, and and the sort of dollar value at the end local regulations are a big part of this and we'll go into this shortly um, as far as biosecurity concerns uh, regulations um, here make it very difficult for us to use say food waste or a manure or a putrescent waste to feed an insect and then feed it to an animal. Um, and then we can't use it as uh, human consumption either. So we have all these regulations which vary around the world. Um, there's some big changes just being made now in the EU. And I think a lot of the world will be following with that as far as approvals for human consumption and animal feed. This has been something that's been holding the whole industry back, but it's looking like making some big moves uh, this year. So. Uh, watch this space on the regulations, but certainly that will determine also as far as your business, uh, what, what you can do there. Um, obviously the market and business opportunities, you know, you don't want to be too far away from your market if you're a small producer. Um, if you've got no, you know, it's, it's the simple thing of making sure you have a space, place to put your product at the end. Um, and the big thing is knowledge for insects. Each insect has different methods of growth. Each insect has different needs um, and requirements. And there's you know, many different methods people are using. So it's really good to get educated and understand as much as you can before you get into growing 
uh, insects. They're not, not as easy as uh, you think. They look fairly easy, but when you get into it, you start growing these on mass, particularly out of a lab, they, uh, they do present other issues which we have to be aware of. So um, get educated on, on insects. There's a lot of information out there. Um, you can contact people like myself who have been in it for a while. Um, we also have a lot of solutions we're coming up with for, for other things there. So I know the straw situation in India with a lot of uh, straw being burnt. Um, we ask constantly, you know, can we use straw to feed uh, insects? I believe the answer is yes. However, I think the stuff we're trying to do now is develop technology that would make that straw a much more usable product for uh, things like soldier flies. Um, as it stands now, we can't use it, but we're hoping in the future we can develop something which we can make that a much more usable product and we could do small on-site solutions for, um, for farms, you know, for, the, for the small farmer. Right, safety and biosecurity. This is, this is probably one of the most important parts of insect farming today. And one of the parts that is fairly well ignored, um, I suppose, by mainstream promotion and marketing of, of insect farms. The environment we're growing insects in is also the perfect environment to rear bacteria, pathogens, mold and fungi. So that's known, I guess, in food safety as the danger zone. Um, and these sorts of things growing in an insect farm can be hazardous to the insects, particularly your uh, mealworms and your um, crickets and th those sort of ones that they're susceptible to some of those diseases less so to um, soldier fly larvae and fly larvae. Um, however, that disease isn't only a problem for the insect, it is also a, a big problem for humans interacting with it. Um, we've seen cases of mold uh, being established in fly farms, not directly with the flies or in the area they're growing, but more so in the room, that if it's not well ventilated, if there's not enough light uh, and, and things like this. You know, it is high humidity, so anything, it doesn't take longer to get out of control. Uh, the symptoms of a simple uh, black mold infection for a human can be any, anything from you know, a cough, a small respiratory problem right through to pneumonia. So uh, that's on the good side of, I suppose, the disease part of it. However, that, that environment also acts as a big petri dish for other, other things and other pathogens. So um, we have to be careful when we're using uh, what we call post-consumer food waste and things like that. We have to keep it as sterile as we can because we can also propagate disease and pathogen in this environment if we're not careful. So this is an extremely uh, important fact that needs to be considered with Sorry, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> um, right, so be very careful of that. Um, and then we move on to, um, yeah, and, and so we've got to manage that from every aspect. So that's putting inputs into the farm right through to sorting out um, insects from frass and castings at the end. I was watching a video on a, a mealworm farm and they actually wear big suits when they are sorting out the mealworms from the, the castings because of the dangers involved there. So be, be wary of this. It can, uh, it can cause you a bit of grief if you're not careful. Um, right, let's get into farming challenges. Um, so the big, the big one, I suppose, is the preparation for a farm. You know, it's going to be intensive um, and ec or extensive or a mixture of both. We have different methods. I'll concentrate more here on, um, I guess, fly farming, because that's what I've got probably the most experience in. Now it's sort of, it's, it's justified across all the, the insects. Um, intensive farms require a lot of energy um, and, and a lot of labor to, to operate. So they're one of those things that, you know, you need a lot of capacity to, to do it. And they really are at the top of the, the um, commercial scale there. You need to control every aspect from uh, breeding right through to the finished product. They, um, they are extremely expensive to set up with the off-the-shelf systems that are currently available. Um, and that's 
you know, and, and I suppose the, the other challenge around that is these systems require a lot of skills as far as robotics um, and that kind of technology to operate. So that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, and they're really good for places that have high labor costs. So that, you know, like throughout Europe, that's what they're going with. Um, the extensive systems in soldier flies are quite varied in what they do, but we put them in um, small trays and we feed them manually every day and simply sort them out at the end of end of a week. So that's that's that compared to an automated system, which would have thousands of you know boxes full of grubs going everywhere. Um, the breeding side of it is also quite a challenge on, on all insects. So you have to understand, um, I suppose, trial with these things and see what works. Um, for soldier flies, we know we need a, a pretty much a 12 hour day of good sunlight to grow them. Uh, so we do, um, we'd have that in one section and then we bring the eggs from there, we bring them over to a different, a different part to fatten them out. The, um, the other part of doing that in an extensive system is to catch them uh, locally. And that's a simple matter of putting a trap out, they lay eggs in it and we just harvest them. It's like a wild harvest. And that's, that's uh, probably the most popular when we get into the more humid regions where I am, uh, we, we can't achieve that very well here. So we have to breed and it's, uh, it's a bit of a pain and big cost as well. So obviously talking there, the local environment also dictates your, um, your capacity to grow grow different insects. So the breeding component for soldier flies, it's essential to have humidity, uh, good light and heat. Uh, whereas other insects, we can get away with um, standard, standard uh, daily conditions um, much easier. And from there, obviously we spoke about breeding and stocking densities is the other big issue there. Oh, so, um, yeah, so various combinations there um, we talked about to, to suit the grower. And that's, I think the other part of that is different business models as far as the local industry goes. Thinking of, I suppose, the Indian um, and, and Southeast Asian um, place in small farms. We're looking at, you know, a much more, I suppose, extensive way of growing things, but um, a lot more of them in various locations, bringing them all together, I think would be ultimately the way to do that. Um, where are we up to here? Um, Hang on, have I, have I missed one there? No, um, and, I, and, then, and that's the batch method of growing things too. So that's where we have every day a new box of maggots or insects and pulling them out. Oh, there. Um, the batch method is, is something I think most farms work on, but you need to also keep different ages of insects separate to make, your, make separation out uh, easy. Um, anyway, we'll go on to the next one there. Um, so feed preparation is another big part of insect growing. If we're looking at the big part of the, the human consumption insects, that feed has to be dry. So for mealworms and crickets, it has to be relatively dry with a water source. Um, if we go to the other end of that for water, soldier flies and cockroaches like a really moist environment and they need to access that feed um, and they use that moisture to do that. We also have to make sure that um, that feed is in the right sort of um, um, state so we can sort it out later. So we wouldn't be putting whole bits of, I don't know, pumpkin or lettuce or something in a, in a bin. We want to chop that up so at the end we can sort it out and we have smaller bits to deal with. It also allows us more access so we can get a lot more uh, bulk of insects in there to eat it. Um, Another part about this is the amount and timing of feeding insects. Um, mealworms and that kind of thing, we're feeding them every week versus soldier flies and cockroaches, we're feeding them as often as we can. So the amount and timing of this is crucial because it also works in disease prevention. So we need to put in small amounts more regularly rather than a large amount and hoping for a good result. If we, for instance, put in a large amount of food waste or organic matter into a bin and we put some baby maggots on there to, to grow. Um, ultimately, microbes will take over, it'll heat up and it'll kill them all and possibly cause a mold or bacterial infection. So we have to be careful of that. So it's all about timing and balance there. We just put just enough in to feed them every day. Um, not too much. And the other part is not too little. The moment where they aren't eating, they're burning energy and uh, getting smaller, it'll take longer to grow your product. 
Um, the environment, so the environment does vary, but generally it's humidity is a big factor here, particularly when we get to the breeding side of it, um, temperature and lighting. So humidity, we're sitting here to breed around 60 or 70% humidity, which is common across a lot of insects. There's um, temperature around at 28 mark and the lighting for breeding is around, um, we work on a 12, 12, Day. So 12 hours of light, uh, 12 hours of darkness. However, those parameters are changing with more research and we're finding out new things. We've got a colony of um, crickets growing in Sydney now, which I think now grow on a, um, a completely dry environment. So there's just enough moisture for them to drink. Um, and there are enough generations and now genetically they've changed to accept that environment. So there's a lot of scope there to, to change genetics to suit different environments. And I think that's going down the lines of the, the disease problems that people have. Let's say if we can eliminate one of those factors, particularly say humidity, we really reduce our uh, problems later on. So environment's a really big one to consider there, um, as well as airflow and things like that. We don't wanna to have tons of insects in a small space and confined space um, without any good airflow. We'll, we'll, um, cook them or they will um, create an environment that's dangerous to, to humans. So be very careful of that. And also great airflow, um, you know, they need air to breathe and live and do well. So that's a big part of it. Um, stocking densities, right. So stocking densities, um, there's no rules to this. There's a lot of problems we're finding with um, as some systems in getting good stocking numbers. The stocking densities are, um, come back to uh, our finished product. So if we have, say a small box, we'd like to grow um, soldier fly larvae in, we need to have that box, um, we need to know the end capacity of that box. So how much frass we will have and how many maggots we will get. So we start from the, that end and work backwards. Now, this is where it comes really important to understand everything there is to know about ratios um, as far as feed conversion ratios and things like this. So if we have a, um, a good converter, a good food waste, so we have tons of um, vegetables that are going into this, we know we can convert that down. That'll reduce down to very little frass, but a good amount of soldier fly. We'll end up somewhere around you know, 50 or 60% soldier fly at the end um, and 30 or 40% um, of frass. So that's a really good stocking rate, but we know we can't get that with grain. We're lucky to get, um, I suppose, a 10 to one conversion with some grains. So we have to be careful of that when we're working it out. So that conversion ratio will determine how big your end product is and how much you can fit in that box. So these are, it's always good to get into a few trials and work that out because this is a um, the stocking densities change from system to system, from insect to insect, um, and even within in um, in the same insect variety as well. So this is a really big thing, and it's unfortunately there's no rule to this. It's something you have to work out as you go. I don't think uh, anyone can claim consistent results in this yet either. So it's it's a really important thing to understand, but. Um, the other part of that is if you have too much stock in a small area that's not being fed, they can start to cannibalise each other. So we don't want that, obviously. Um, so make, make sure we, we keep on top of uh, our densities. Right. So we're going to get, um, I'll teach you how to, uh, the things that we do here to set up a fly farm, because this is the, probably the part I really love doing. Um, so we've got our main things to consider. So we go into a place now to set up a fly farm and we say, right, what, what are our feedstocks? Uh, what are our end market? The feedstocks available, um, and so, so here and how we're gonna process them. So in our case here, we use a lot of cereals and grains, um, but also chicken manure uh, to, to grow our product. So we have to make sure we can process that safely to start with uh, and store it. This is a, the other part is storage of materials beforehand. We don't want them getting infected with other bacteria. So we, we want to set that up and then keep it sterile, so as sterile as we can. Um, some people like to ferment their inputs. And this is this is really good if you want to, um, I suppose, store them for a longer time, if you don't have the throughput. 
Um, it does create other issues, but one of the great things about it is generally you're putting in a, um, a great bacteria to get it started. It's like silaging um, corn or something like that. So you get your protein up through the bacteria count and you'll also get a much better result at the end. So that's something we do. We, um, we use grains, then we inoculate it. We um, build our bacteria profile in there. Um, so we're using good bacteria in there, obviously not dangerous ones. We get our bacteria count up and our protein up by about 10%. Um, it also gives us a different um, medium to work with. We, get a very, we, we also, we mill it right down to a very fine powder. Then we mix it and mix it and we end up with a blend of product, which is perfect for flies to eat. But there's a, there's a lot of work there. Um, that's just with the grain, with the chicken manure, we simply just wet it and um, and we try to keep it sterile at the same time. So that's that's our biggest challenge is to make sure we can keep it as clean as we can before we put it in because we'll get our other bacteria load uh, in there. We get, we get that product and we stick it in um, bins. And then from there, we get the eggs from our breeding facility. So every day we're pulling eggs out of our breeding facility and applying them to that, that bit of product every day. Um, that's on a daily basis. So we have to work that out on you know, the availability of each product. So we don't end up with um, an imbalance of too many eggs and not enough product or not enough product and, and too many eggs. You know, we want to get that balance all right. And we're doing that all in a controlled environment. The, biggest, the hardest thing here is controlling this environment. So the environment has to be, um, it's always fighting it itself. So we have, you know, tons of boxes of uh, maggots growing in feed, which are trying to get really hot um, and kill and basically compost themselves. So we need the maggots to take over, control that composting bacteria, but also have enough to feed. Um, but in turn, the maggots are creating heat, which is promoting uh, the growth of bacteria as well that we don't want. So we have to make sure we keep it cool. And this is one of the big challenges, keeping it cool and keeping our microbiology under control in the whole systems, in, in, all, in all aspects of the system. Um, we get out of balance. If the maggots get too hot, they stop eating um, and they start, um, they start trying to escape or they'll start, uh, start cannibalizing each other or sometimes they'll bury down into the heat and, and just die and get cooked in there. So we get to that point where we have to be very vigilant of what's going on. And this is where our technology part, it's probably the most important, even on an extensive system, we need to add um, temperature probes um, and things like that, just so we understand what's going on so we can amend things that are happening. In a small box, and uh, in a small system, it's quite easy to turn over um, the product in there and, uh, and, and get that heat out. We use a little fan on our boxes sometimes just to cool them down if they get too hot. Um, that is that is one of the biggest things we see here is that heat and then the heat promoting other bacterial growth and creating a much more dangerous environment to work in. Um, from there, um, we've grown our maggots in the box. We need, need to sort them out and that's at about day 14 in general. But depending on the type of feed you use, that can go out to about 30 days as well, sometimes out to 45. So um, if you don't have a good feed source, um, you're going to be struggling with space to, to get a product out in time. Um, we, we get that product, we sift it um, through a basic, uh, a basic strainer, shaking, shaking strainer, and we get our maggots and our frass out separately that way. The one thing that will happen if you have an inconsistent feeding regime with there, you'll get inconsistency in your end product and it makes it really difficult to sort them out. So, we want, we want our product to be, you know, all this pretty much standard size maggot that's coming out, the grub, and we want that to be larger than the size of the frass um, or the casting. So that's one of those things, if it's not quite right, um, a smaller maggot doesn't quite work through the sieve and vice versa. So we need to, we need to consider that um, all the way through about getting that balance right. It's all about getting a consistent um, end product. Um, and then, and then from there, we, uh, freeze the maggots and dry them, then the frass gets pressed into pellets for fertilizer. Um, equally, that frass needs to be dealt with in a safe manner. It is dangerous stuff. So make sure you're wearing respiratory equipment if you can, or do it in a ventilated area outside because uh, that stuff can make you sick. Um, 
and that's one, one of the untold stories of uh, insect farming is the castings can be quite dangerous. Uh, the other part of this is looking at your labour and energy requirements. So, you know, a lot of places don't have a great energy supply, electricity, or they have no supply. So you have to do a very extensive system. However, they might have a lot of labour there. So we might be able to grow maggots in big, long um, pits on the ground, which has been done quite a bit. Um, and if we have cheap enough labour or, or enough labour, uh, we can also sort it out that way and do a much bigger um, bulk product. This is, um, yeah, so there's a fair bit to go into this. Um, the other part I was going to say is we do not have a good feed input and when they're not maintained throughout the process, if we wish to use those maggots at the end to evolve into flies at the end of their life cycle, they may not turn into flies if they haven't had a good diet. So the important thing about this is working out how that farm would work. If you don't have a great diet to breed from or to grow your maggots to a breeding, breeding thing, you might want to end up setting up your own um, smaller breeding system for maggots as well. So we can just have a, a really good supply of high quality eggs and babies uh, to grow out. So that's, that's the other big part of that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So we get that we get that end product. We freeze it here, or you can you can dry it, um, and then that that can be further refined. Now, the refining of those products breaks it breaks down to um, a meal, a meat meal, a high protein meal, and a fat. Um, and the fats really vary a lot in what they what they have in them, but generally it's a it's a pretty good uh, it's a pretty good product. And we're looking at that to replace. Um, you know, components in fish feeds. So it's replacing a part that traditionally uh, fish meal would be would be getting used for. We're also looking at, at as poultry feed as well, but the high value market really is um, in the animal market is for, um, for fish feeds. Anyway, that's it. That's, that's how we sort of get it. I hope I've run over how to get to a, uh, how to sort of get a rough idea of what you need to get a fly farm going or, or an insect farm. There's quite a bit in there, um, but generally the overall thing is to understand the economics. It's very hard um, on a country by country basis to sort of determine which technology to use if you use technology or how you will set one up. You know, there's so many different factors in insect growing, um, but that's what I'm sort of here for now, I guess, I'll get on to uh, uh, that's um, sort of helping out a lot of people now with, um, I suppose, advice and consultancy on, on getting insect farms started and things they should look at. So um, I hope I've covered a bit of what everyone needs to know in that. Um, if there are any questions, um, yeah, please, um, yeah, I suppose fire out now. We'll see what we can, we can help with. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mike. You have already elaborated regarding the farming uh, details and all. So I'll ask our participant if anybody want to make it. I'll unmute uh, everyone. Uh, like you will have a privilege of unmuting and asking the questions directly. Uh, so please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, you know yeah. Make uh, it's nice uh, overview. You know, it's a very uh, emerging topic. I am Dr. Sinu from Central University of Kerala. Uh, I have a question. You know, regarding it, maybe it is too early to ask this question. What is the chance that this product can be adulterated? like uh, other feeds, you know, because this, there are uh, the feed which we are making out of uh, uh, seafood and sea animals and all, everything now is getting adulterated, adulterated and we are not very sure whether this is a genuine thing or not. So what is the chance in a scale, you know, that this um, entomological, for human food or cosmetic thing, you know, this is really coming out of uh, the insects or it is just adulterated by mugging up with some so many things. 
Um, yeah. So is that yeah? What what are the chances of it of it getting used for that or for, for aquaculture or? You know, what are the chances for this product to get adulterated? You know, adulterated. Eventuated. Um, uh, adulterated. That is, it is. They they may be. Uh, they may be claiming that this is an entomological product, but it is not really uh, an entomological product at all. Oh, um, I'm not. I'm not too sure. It might, it might be too early. I think um, there's a lot of research being done throughout. I suppose how it can be used. Um, and I, I suppose the real question is how good is it, especially when we look at cosmetics and things like that. I think um, majority of the research has been done around the use for as a protein replacement and it looks good. Um, the rest of it is being done in that sort of research part is, I suppose, driven by industry in a, in a sense. So cosmetics and things like that, it's still very early days. So I think there's a lot of talk about how it can be used, but we're still finding markets. Um, and I, I think that's going to come down to investment as well of, of how, they can, how they can be used and where they will be used. Uh, Mick, maybe I'll write to you. Now, the, the other quick question is, how do you keep the parasitoids away from these worms? Parasitoids? Uh, yeah, like the, the bacterias and the other, the other little insects and stuff. Um, yes, yes. It's hard. Um, we we're fortunate here. We have a we have a really good sealed building. We do it in, but we still have infections. Um, there are a number of ways. We light is probably light. If you have natural light, it can work in your favour, but can also work against you in other things. So um, we we're very we we use a bit of uh, UV light as well. Um, and airflow, but we quite often get infections. Not so much now from bacteria. Um, but more so from other insects getting in, um, which get in somehow in our system. We do get bacteria growing in our bins, which are more of a composting bacteria, but they're equally, they can be quite dangerous as well. So we're, we're conscious of that and we use a lot of, um, I suppose, UV and airflow to try and reduce that risk of it taking over. But it's, it is one of those, if you don't get on top of it, it can, uh, it can kill everything very quickly um, just through the heat. So yeah, we, we use mainly airflow, UV um, and, and light, different light to control what we can. Thanks, thanks Mick. Yeah, thank hello. you. Yeah, we can uh, get, get in touch, yeah. send me an email if yeah. you like. Yeah. Yeah. Chat more. Yeah. yeah. Hello, hello sir. Yes. Hello. Yeah, Hi. sir, a small question from my side, sir. Uh, so to start the uh, insect farming, uh, does the insect uh, does the it will come automatically, or do we need to procure from uh, from a farm or somewhere to start it to start a farming? Just to so, start it. To start a insect farming. To yeah. Start a, yeah. From where we can get the, those is egg insects insect eggs. Okay. Um. Yeah. Generally, the best idea, particularly if you're going to do it um, in, a, in a local environment, and the idea is not to spend too much money on this, uh, you can get them locally. And there's a number of ways. So the soldier fly, which we have, we've caught all locally. And we've simply done that by putting um, some food, rotting food, into a, um, into a small tub that they can access in, in the shade. They access that and we get, first we'll get... Um, your everyday housefly getting in there. Oh. And then if you wait about 10 days after that, you'll start oh. to see the black soldier fly larvae. They, they're oh. much slower to grow, but we catch oh. them all locally. Um, oh. And it's local ones are best suited to your environment as well. So if you want to grow them at, um, there, you just see what you can catch and, and grow with that. There are other growers um, in, uh, throughout India as well. There's a, there's a number of Facebook groups um, uh, around black soldier fly farming. Um, even the Australian black soldier fly uh, Facebook group has a lot of Indian um, participants in it as well. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are many small people there that are also selling their product if you'd like to get a start like that. So mm -hmm. I'll jump, jump online and find on the, on the social media stuff because there are plenty of people out there. Um, okay. Yeah. And the next question is, uh, 
uh, suppose we think that uh, if we are success in a farming of a one particular insect, so where can we think of the marketing of that insect? The proof of the market? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think this is one of the big challenges. The, the yeah. market is still very, very new. Um, we're relying on big companies overseas that are leading the way um, and, and they're doing it in combination with um, animal feed manufacturers. So okay. they're, they're spending a lot of money. There is a lot of interest, um, particularly by shrimp farmers yeah. for the product um, and things like that. So it's, it's still early days as far as that market, but I think um, the market also is relying on regulations to be updated as well. Yeah. So that's something we're very wary of. We don't want to spend too much money yeah. just yet because the market is developing. Um, yeah. But also we're looking yeah. at, yeah, we're, we're looking at other things here of importing product yeah. um, because we, we can we can look at product to bring into Australia. If it's grown in the in the correct correct way, we can bring it in ourselves and then we can process it to a, for a product locally as well. So yeah. we do have a few advantages of what we can do here. So there are some opportunities coming up, we think. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for your prompt answer. Sir. Thank no, you. thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, participant? Any other questions you want to know from the Mr. Mick Tornes? Any other? You have the privilege to speak directly to him. Any other? Uh, if there is no question. So it's a very nice talk and you have elaborately described about the rating of uh, this one, what are the conditions and what are the problem that we face while rating the insect. Uh, so from my side, I just wanted to know uh, in Australia, what is the means that the product that you have produced that is the insect protein, uh, it is basically, uh, which one is preferred more if for the human consumption or either for the feed or which, which one you are using the, your product? Uh, it's all for animal animal feed at the moment, not for human consumption. Um, we're working now to do, I think we have meetings next week to see if we can develop a product for human consumption. Um, but it's, it won't be readily, readily accepted, I don't think. So we're really focusing on animal feed for aquaculture is our main main industry that we want to approach. And, and that's as a replacement for uh, mainly fish and soy meal. So it's about but being a sustainable uh, alternative for the feed manufacturers. So that, that's where we're heading. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and I just wanted to know, what is the, uh, means how much uh, uh, return you are getting from uh, this one? And well, in, turn or, in terms of profitability. In, in terms, in terms of, of profit. Yeah, what? profit. That how much return you are getting uh, annually or whatever the way. Uh, so profitability. Is uh, we're, we're, we aren't making much money at all yet. We're still very early. So we've just finished our technology development um, okay. now. Okay. So we're about to, we're looking at going to the market over the next month. Um, but that's a very small market we're, yeah. we're looking at. So we're not making it, we're, but the numbers look somewhere um as a dry product, we're looking at somewhere like about $5 a kilo in the wholesale market. But if we go direct to retail, okay. we're looking at something around uh, $20 to $30 for a specialty market. And it's a niche market. Um, if we look at wholesale for animal feed, however, that product will be worth okay. around $1,100 a ton. That's about the top market price we can get for it. So it's a, it's a tough market at the moment. We have to produce quite a lot. Um, you know, eleven hundred dollars a ton. You know, there's around that's a dry product. There's about four tons of maggots to make one ton of dry um, maggot meal. So, and from that four tons, that takes about fifty tons of food waste to grow that much. So, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of lot of inputs we need to get to that size. <laughs> it's not it's not as easy as we hope. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very, uh, it's not easy. So a lot of hardship is required to make it success. And here in India, particularly our reason, not is India is only mainly concentrating in uh, this one. Uh, lots many eating are consuming edible insect, but popularization still yet to be done. And uh, uh, this one rearing, we haven't started. So we are planning to do it, but it will take time. Uh, so it's always the challenges is there in uh, making acceptability uh, uh, to the public. Yeah, that's I know. 
And uh, if any other uh, participant uh, want to know, okay, sir, please. Uh, good morning, Dr. Mick Tornet. I have heard your this uh, topic. It is very interesting and very good. The only thing uh, we are lacking with some slides. If you present some your this uh, pick, so that will be yes. more beneficial to the participants. Number one. Number two. As you know, this uh, the feed for animals, fish, ducks, and others. This is a major problem for. Northeast Hill region because of our this North East region, these are most of the people are non veg So this uh, animal feed, fish feed, there is a big problem. So we are we are searching about this uh, different type of insects as a solution to promote or to produce a value added product for the feed purpose of yes. the different type of animals, chicks and others. So how this, these insects and what kind of insects uh, we have to go for this type of work? Can you oh. give some details of this? Uh, and if you have some picks of this for the development of different type of feeds through these insects, yes. so that is very valuable for us. The, uh, I, I think the big thing is um, food waste from... Um, the, be the best feed source is food waste from uh, food manufacturers. I think I think ITC is a big one over there, um, and that kind of thing. So that that's that's the feed we're looking at because the insect we need to grow is, has to be, I suppose, cheap enough. Especially if we're going to sell that feed to grow poultry, like ducks and things like that, to get it to the right market price, and might we have to have a very cheap input. So we're looking at. Um, Particularly the, the the flies because they're fast, so they can they can they produce quickly. We're looking at about a fourteen day turnaround from an egg to a fully grown maggot. Whereas if we look to mealworms and stuff, we're looking at about forty days. So we want to stick to the the ones that grow cheaply and fast, which are are the maggots. Um, but also we need a good source of feed for that as well. You know that's that, that's the hard part. And then processing that finished product, that maggot, we can mix with other things to feed you know, as a feed pellet. So I don't know if that's answered the question entirely, but it really does come down to the available feed you have to grow. Um, and, and um, yeah, that, that's probably the biggest thing is the amount of feed, the amount of, and availability of feed you have to grow there. And I believe realistically, there, how much, is there much food waste in India? I believe most of it's used fairly efficiently, isn't it? Or... Is that right? Is, that, is there much food waste in India, or, or is it is it already already used fairly well? No, no, no. We are lacking with the different type of feeds because there is a big problem of this feed. Yeah. We are used molasses and uh, corn cells and others to develop uh, pellets, different type of pellets. But right. uh, uh, these are not sufficient. So we are looking for the new area to yeah. develop new feeds. As uh, one of our this uh, Nagaland farmers, what they are doing, they are uh, rearing of these uh, termites, and these termites uh, they have to use as a fish feed. Really? Yeah. So that uh, that type of things we are looking. Wow, I, I haven't heard of this. The termites sound amazing. Yeah, this uh, mites, this termites, termites are the good protein source for the fish. So if we have to feed these termites to the fish once. So this will be a great uh, profit to the rearing of the fish. Likewise, we are searching the new areas to grow the different type of insects as a fish feed, as a chicken feed, and as a duck feed. I know that. Yeah, certainly. Well, I think, um, well, can, can termites eat straw as well? Yeah. Rice straw? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, perfect. Well, I think... Um, we know, we know the, the other great things of most insects have this antibacterial quality or antipathogen thing. So they're, they're excellent for fish. Um, it makes it a much healthier product and easier, a, a really good input for particularly fish, but I think all animals. So I, I think the soldier flies are a really, good, a really good product, but they do have some difficulties sometimes growing them. Um, but once you get around the difficulties growing them, that you can grow them quite fast and efficiently, and and 
they are a really good feed for fish. Um, I think the, the the fatty acid profile of them as well makes um, has some really good qualities for them. So I, I think that's that's probably the biggest thing if you can get the quantities you need in something like that. Um, and we can grow them on the floor, which is the other great thing. So we can set up bins. I know in China they have big concrete troughs they grow them in, in some places in Africa. They grow them in big troughs and they just fill them up with, um, with food waste and stuff. The maggots eat them, they crawl out. Um, or they harvest them with a, with buckets and, and shovels. So I think um, I see this, I saw this, this uh, harvesting of this uh, apples. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. This. So I, I think I think they've got a, a great future, and I think they've got a very good profile. When you look at nutrition nutritional profile, they're really well suited to um, particularly fish. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Anyway, get get my email and, and uh, get yeah. get in touch there, and we can chat more if you like. <laughs> okay. One more, sir. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I just, uh, it's my curiosity that. Oh. You there? Hello. We've lost you. <laughs> voice, no voice. No noise. Unmute. Yeah, so internet disturbance was there, sir. So my question, my curiosity is there, sir. Uh, exactly in Nagaland, uh, I didn't notice that is uh, they're rearing termite exactly or where they're collecting from the nature. Collecting from the nature. Uh, sir? Yeah, it means uh, it's very difficult to rear. So uh, that's what, uh, okay. Uh, I okay, so it's very difficult also, sir, uh, to be uh, this and to uh, rear that termite. So I think, yeah, they're collecting from the nature. Uh, this is a new uh, receptable uh, area, also. This is a new receptable area for us to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. termites for their fish feed. So I am I'm thinking about this to develop such technology. As you say, this is a problematic, but the area where these mites are a big problem. We can uh, develop this uh, rearing of these mites by using different type of woods, which they have to like, and harvest that for the fish feed. Oh yes, uh, here, sir. In your point, in your point, I want to add up. Uh, I already I mean, so, uh, started and work up regarding the fish feed. Already, uh, we have published a paper also. So uh, I'm utilizing the uh, this one sericulture as in sericulture with pupa. Silicon yeah, yeah. pika because our Nordi state, uh, Manipur is a sericulture state, and we are getting in the huge amount as a waste. So these, uh, all, uh, these we are uh, have we already checked it and we have started, and uh, it is success. Okay. We so using these. You send this. You send the, You send your paper and this. Uh, so we have to develop this technology here for the commercial. For the commercial. Yes, product. yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Later on. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. yes sir. Yeah, we can discuss part. later on, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. So, Mr. I just wanted to know that uh, these cricket as well as cockroaches, they are uh, pests. Uh, cockroach um, for the human and uh, this one a problem as a pest and cricket for the this one agricultural uh, this one uh, crop. So how do you manage? But suppose if it outbreak, is there any government involvement for controlling that your activity or how do you uh, this one control not to uh, spread in the environment? Regarding okay. the cricket. Yeah. yeah. We have, um, we, we're self-regulated so far as well. So we make sure we, um, we look after that. We have local, local um, regulators, the Environment Protection Agency as well. So we, our, our, we're not, the, the flies aren't really a big issue if they get out. Um, however, we are more worried about microbial activity and things like that escaping into the local environment. So they're the things we control really well. We do that with uh, air filters and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we, we don't have much regulation as far as that goes. And one of our, one of our things is more around the, the end product quality and disease control there. So, um, yeah, we, 
we have to conform to local regulations as far as environmental controls go, but there really isn't um, the, the, basically we have to make sure we do the right thing as an industry to do it, to um, bring it forward, you know. Um, and and the, the thing is, if, if you don't do it the right way, that you've ultimately got problems in your system as well, and it'll, it will fail. So yeah, you're quite susceptible. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, if, you, if you don't do it right, it just, it just simply won't work, yeah. Okay. My side, lunch. <laughs> so, uh, uh, adding uh, so many infection microorganism infection is there. So, do you use any antibiotic or any uh, dynamical for management? What was that? Any sorry, antibiotic for the management of diseases that are occurring. Oh. Do you um, use uh, while rearing a lot of uh, microbial infection is there? Do you use any uh, this one? Medicine means either antibiotic or any. Uh, chemicals for uh, management of that disease? No, no, we don't. We can't, we've got to be very careful with chemicals. Um, insects are like, they're, so, they're quite susceptible to any of that kind of stuff. So we, we have to be careful managing it. So we can, um, we, try to, we try to make sure everything's sterile going in as well as we can. Um, we also accept there's going to be some kind of um, infection in there. So it's, um, if we put chemicals in there to control it, we also risk losing and killing the, the, the insects. So we have to be very oh. careful with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and even we're seeing, um, there's been some examples of chemical they've used in chicken farms here to control flies has made it into the chicken manure and we've seen um, deformed uh, insects as a result. So it doesn't take much and we can have a problem as far as chemicals, so we have to be pretty much run organically as much as we can. <laughs> oh yeah, hygiene. Okay, we have to maintain hygiene. Okay, that's uh, uh, okay. Hygiene is essential, uh, yeah. It, uh, yeah, any, uh, any query or any uh, questions from the participant? If uh, no one is there, then we can wind up the morning session. Any 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 participant? Now you we have given the privilege to speak to directly to Mr. McTornet. Any question from the any query from the participant? I think uh, now uh, uh, they have already uh, listened everything. So thank you very much once again and uh, accepting my proposal and to be with us in these uh, workshop and hopefully in future also we can think for the collaborations uh, so thank you very much uh, for spending your valuable time uh, thank you very much thank you everyone have a, a lovely day thank yes you yeah thank yeah. you um yeah and hopefully we yeah, we can do okay. some good collaborations in the future thank you thank you very much sir Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Okay, bye. Oh, dear participant, uh, uh, second session will be start soft at two o'clock. So please join with us and we have a very eminent uh, speaker in the evening also, Dr. Uh, Alman Das, who is uh, specialized in the reading of cricket in India. So I'll be happy uh, if you people join to, uh, together and to listen his lecture. <laughs>